point will be streamed on YouTube. And we're live. And you're the host now, Hernan. Beautiful, thank you. You're welcome. Molly, the chat is restricted to uh, to panelists only. Yep. Perfect. Are any of you guys actually in Woods Hole? Well, Richard is, I think, probably. Mm -hmm. So our, Steve and I are actually the closest, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I think Steve's a little closer than I am. Bye. I am Frank. Small, <laughs> small number of miles. <laughs> How was the storm yesterday at Woods Hole, Richard? I wonder, maybe he can't unmute himself anymore. Yeah, <laughs> all right. Although I don't know if I can unmute him. I don't know if he's even interesting. Can we start letting people in? Yeah, let's do that. One second. How do I do this? Broadcast. All right, Abby. Well, it's great having you here. I'm going to turn off my camera. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, day three of the crisis. It's great to see you all. Uh, we'll wait a few minutes and then we'll get started. So weird to see so many friends and not be able to talk to them or anything from all over the world. I can see it's pretty exciting. All right, we'll wait maybe 30 more seconds. Hey, Phil. <laughs> Thanks for typing that in. It's nice to see you. That's Phil Nelson. He's joined us. Cool. Yeah, lots of fun. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. And uh, as usual, welcome to uh, Physical Biology of the Cell 2020 Bizarre Edition, brought to you not live from Woods Hole. And um, we're very happy that you joined us. And uh, I think everybody knows the drill at this point. So I'm gonna just cut right to it. Um, we are excited today to have Avi Rodal from Brandeis University and Steve Del Signore. And uh, as actually has happened in the past, Avi's got uh, tricks up her sleeve for uh, giving us a, a different kind of talk, I think, than the usual, which is Part of the fun of having her join us. So just a few quick biographical facts. So uh, Avi was an undergrad at MIT and then she went to UC Berkeley where she worked with David Drubin um, doing really interesting stuff on cell biology if I remember correctly primarily things related to act the act inside a skeleton 
And uh, then she was a postdoc uh, at MIT. And after that, joined the faculty at Brandeis, which is where she's been ever since. And um, I think actually, I'm remembering this correctly too, is that her interests have uh, broadened to include what's going on at Membranes. And she's been doing a lot of really interesting stuff. And I think that's actually what she talked to us about last time uh, in the course. And um, since she actually told me that she and her co-speaker are going to introduce themselves, I think rather than me continuing as much fun as that might be, I'll, I'll uh, let you two have at it. And uh, I'll warn you at, as I told you at 9.55 and just for everybody out in the audience, as you have now seen for a few days, uh, we definitely have more questions than we can field and Aaron and I are trying to read them and just make some guesses about what people will be most interested in hearing and also trying to see where there seems to be some commonality in the questions. So please forgive us uh, if we don't get to your question. Um, Molly has figured out how to actually do a screen capture on the questions and pass those along to the speaker. So it is possible that you'll be able to con uh, continue the conversation afterwards. Uh, with all that said, I'm very happy that you're here, Abby, and look forward to hearing what you have to tell us. Great, so thank you so much for having us. Uh, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start out by talking a little bit about who we are and what we're doing and what our perspective is. Um, it's great to see all these people in the audience. Um, we really welcome uh, all of your comments and suggestions. Um, what we're gonna talk about today is almost entirely unpublished work and new ideas, including some very, very recent stuff that we've been doing. Um, and so I encourage you to get in touch with us um, uh, so our contact information is right here on this slide, um, our, our Twitter handles and so on. So please, please, we want your feedback, uh, especially from this fantastic diverse group. So um, uh, I'm Avi, uh, I'm an associate professor at Brandeis, as Rob said. Um, my background is as a, a cell biologist. Um, I've been working uh, on the cells in the nervous system for some time um, and um, uh, what we're going to talk about today is how we're applying some kind of new quantitative approaches. Uh, and so this is someone who's, you know, absolutely a biologist trying to uh, go into some new areas, some new ways of thinking about things. Uh, and so hopefully, in addition to learning about some cool science today, you can also see uh, from the story that we're going to tell how we made this journey to apply new uh, quantitative and even modeling approaches, uh, even though uh, you might think of us more as biologists than as theorists. Um, so that's kind of where I'm coming from. Uh, so S Steve, who I'm going to let him introduce himself a little bit, is uh, a, a colleague and a senior postdoc in my lab. Uh, and we thought it would be really fun to have this joint um, system here, both so that you don't have to just listen to my voice droning on. Uh, and also uh, uh, just because um, we've been intellectual partners in this work and Steve has done pretty much all of the experiments uh, and modeling that he, we're gonna talk about today. Um, and so uh, we thought that this would be a much more fun uh, and engaging way to do it. All right, so Steve, wanna tell us about your kind of journey to where we are here? Sure, yeah, so basically I'm a postdoc in Avi's lab. And so from, I would say my PhD work at Tufts and Victor Attini's lab, all the way through what I've been working on in Avi's lab, I've just generally been interested in um, how proteins within a context, uh, within a complex organismal context can sort of generate dynamics and, and do interesting work to create um, intracellular and cellular uh, dynamics, uh, in particular using imaging based approaches. And hopefully you'll see some of that today. And I'll just hand it right back to Avi. Okay, so um, Steve's in control of the slides. And so he's gonna be clicking through and I'm gonna be talking. All right, so this is a, a slide describes the a, a general overview of the questions that we're interested in in our lab. Uh, and so the, the cartoon uh, shows you kind of in a schematic way how uh, the intracellular membrane traffic from the plasma membrane uh, through endosomes and the lysosome and sort of maybe back out to the plasma membrane uh, requires a, an intricate coordination of hundreds of proteins, dozens of lipids that all work together to make sure that you get the right fluxes of cargos through these different pathways. And we really, there's a, a jillion open questions about how this works from the protein mechanism level to the sort of cellular physiology, how you might switch fluxes through different pathways. And so that's, those are the big questions that we're interested in. And we're particularly interested in, in specialized cells 
uh, particularly neurons that have to adapt this membrane traffic machinery to work over very long distances, maybe over meters uh, in their extremely elongated morphologies that are really, really highly specialized for membrane traffic. Uh, and in particular, down at the kind of business end of the neuron, which we call the synapse, uh, membrane traffic is really, really um, highly specialized to do what one of the main jobs of neurons are, which is to uh, send chemical signals or neurotransmitters uh, by releasing uh, synaptic vesicles containing these neurotransmitters. Um, and so that's a very busy uh, membrane uh, trafficking component of the of the cell. Uh, and what I'm, we're particularly going to focus on today is uh, the endocytosis part or reuptake part of the cycle. And so you can imagine if you have in many neurons, you know, hundreds or thousands or even some, in some synapses, hundreds of thousands of vesicles fusing, that presents two big problems. One, you don't want your synaptic plasma membrane to expand to infinity. That would obviously be a problem. Um, so you need to somehow take that membrane back up. And then also, uh, in order to generate new synaptic vesicles for new rounds of release of neurotransmitter, you have to reuptake that membrane and all the membrane components. And so um, there are a lot of things known about this process and then a lot of open mysteries. And so um, well, well, this slide illustrates sort of four um, different things a single neuron might need to do in its lifetime. Uh, in order to take up membrane. So uh, ranging from on the left, you have um, just, it turns out that most neurons spontaneously release synaptic vesicles, um, even in the absence of an action potential. And that's actually a very physiologically important process for those of you who are uh, neuroscientists or uh, familiar with that field. These are called minis or single release events. And that membrane needs to be taken up. Um, when a neuron fires an action potential, you might get a, a, a fast release and fast uptake. That's called ultra-fast endocytosis. Uh, at increased activity, so it might be multiple action potentials, um, then you get a, a clathrin-mediated endocytosis that might be a little bit slower. And then with a very strong stimulus, which can occur physiologically and under many conditions, um, you need to get very, very rapid uptake of membrane. And so you get these big invaginations of membrane off of which nice little synaptic vesicles reform. And so one thing that's really critical to remember here is that uh, in order to package the right amount of neurotransmitter into a vesicle, it has to be a very specific size and shape. And so that's where the machinery that drives the reformation of these vesicles is really critically important. And so something that's kind of a mystery uh, uh, is that although we know from many, many years of experiments from many, many different labs that these processes use the same basic machinery as is used for endocytosis in non-neuronal cells uh, all through your body and yeast cells and all kinds of different you know, organisms across the whole eukaryotic tree, um, some special adaptations are required in order to be able to take the same machinery and get this biology occurring across these vastly different timescales. Okay, so I'm gonna, we're gonna, um, all of the data that we're gonna show you today is gonna actually focus on this kind of most simplest case on the left, the spontaneous vesicle release. So all the data we're gonna show you today is gonna be in synapses at rest, because for now that's what we've gotten to so far. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, what I'm gonna do now is sort of take you through what we do know about this basic machinery of, of uh, endocytosis in non-neuronal cells, which is, which is where we have the most mechanistic information. Okay, so bending the membrane and taking in a vesicle is a very energetically demanding process. Uh, and over the last you know, 20, 30 years, we've identified a lot of molecules from different model systems ranging from uh, uh, yeast has been a big model system for studying this. Um, uh, so we've identified these molecules that are required for sequential deformation, pinching, and release of vesicles from the membrane. Some these molecules might be familiar to you, um, but what I want to focus on uh, is that they're, they're really, we're talking about like, you know, 50 plus different molecules uh, that are involved in this process. So this is not just a few molecules like clathrin and adapters and dynamin. There are a lot of proteins uh, and lipids that are required in cells to drive these sequential steps. And so, um, uh, Steve, can you go back for a second? I wasn't quite ready. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so uh, these these you know dozens of what we're going to call in this talk endocytic accessory proteins are important for for the sequential recruitment of the right membrane bending molecules. Uh, and th these membrane bending molecules include proteins that bind to and deform the membrane, and also really importantly, the force generating actin cytoskeleton. Um, and so if you look at the movies, I'm not sure if they would play again. What you can see is that at sites of endocytosis in either mammalian cells you can see on the top or yeast cells you can see at the bottom, you can see a sequential recruitment of say the green protein comes first and the red protein comes later. Uh, and those define sequential steps of the endocytic pathway. And by doing this two, kind of two color quantitative imaging, people have been able to line up um, a, a sequential order of events and start to develop some models. So this is, these are some things that we do know. We know the players, we know the orders in which they arrive to sites of endocytosis, but there's a lot of things that we still don't know about endocytosis in general. So we don't understand how all these sequential steps are regulated. We don't understand what all these dozens of endocytic accessory proteins do uh, and how they work together. Uh, we don't understand really, and this is a really a great uh, developing area, and mostly what I talked about, if any of you were um, at MBL last year, is how the forces for membrane bending and actin assembly, and actually the um, energetics of the interaction between these endocytic accessory proteins work together to overcome the energy barriers for budding and scission. Um, and then the question that we're asking here, uh, which is a giant open question, is how do you take this machinery and adapt it to specialized cell types, maybe that are in very tightly adherent tissues or in cell types like neurons that are really highly specialized for, like I showed you guys before, those um, different modes of endocytosis. And so, yeah, so just to sort of summarize, I think some of the really essential differences that we can see between non-neuronal cells, like Avi's been describing, and the endocytic machinery at synapse is I think there's a few key features that are particularly uh, relevant. So in a non-neuronal cell, the typical concentrations of these might be uh, one micromolar or less. Uh, and they're recruited to these um, sites that you just saw in the previous movie that are effectively the, the same size uh, as the endocytic event itself, which is sort of noted here by these black spots. And you can see the correspondence. They're basically a diffraction limited uh, spot and uh, in a non-neuronal cell, these are sort of transiently assembled and recruited on demand uh, in the sequence, as Avi mentioned, uh, to drive an endocytic event. And, and basically, uh, in these, the cell type, the recruitment is effectively um, e equal to the activation and the um, actual event itself. At synapses, this is very different. So um, here, you, you can sort of see a general very schematic idea about the general way that this machinery is viewed at synapses, which is that you have this site of vesicle fusion and vesicle release here, which is the active zone. And then lateral to that, in this again, very poorly defined spatial region just around it, uh, this is called a periactive zone, just because it's around the active zone, is generally considered to be the site of uh, endocytosis. And what you can see by looking at this hippocampal synapse or this drosophila neuromuscular junction, uh, endocytic proteins here in green or here in green and magenta aren't forming these individual diffraction limited spots. Instead, they're covering larger um, membrane domains that uh, can cover hundreds of nanometers up to a uh, micron scale. And um, in addition to this sort of increased scale, uh, the proteins here are also accumulating at much higher concentrations, so five to many tens of micromolar concentration. And we see at the membrane that uh, these molecules tend to have slower diffusion or mobility, so suggesting that there is more of a persistent recruitment to the membrane uh, than in this case. And, and so altogether, that idea sort of uh, congeals around this idea that recruitment at the synapse isn't exactly equal to activation the way it might be uh, in a non-neuronal cell. And so what I guess the expectation would be that if you had active sites of release, so here marked by these active zones in red, you would expect in a neuron maybe, if it behaved just like in a non-neuronal cell, that you'd get this um, recruitment of endocytic proteins just nearby the uh, releasing active zone in, in a way that's sort of temporarily correlated with the release event. 
Whereas instead, what we actually see, again, this is a schematic of this neuromuscular junction here, is that this, this endocytic machinery is in fact covering these large membrane domains that, that as far as we know, really have little to no correlation to uh, any temporal or spatial um, release event at the active zone. And so, um, so I just wanna kind of highlight some of the tools that we've already uh, got that for decades have, have studied endocyti endocytosis and synapses and endocytic dynamics. Um, so maybe some of the very first studies and, and continuing to this day use electron microscopy, which has obviously the advantage of incredible spatial resolution and combined with some other um, advanced stimulating and, and fixing um, strategies also can, can yield very good temporal resolution. Uh, met methods like capacitance measurements of very large synapses that can detect changes in membrane surface area that can provide very, very highly resolved in time measurements of um, membrane release and reuptake events. Uh, or uh, dye labeling strategies such as this pH sensitive uh, dye that's tethered to a synaptic vesicle protein where the, the fluorescence intensity changes uh, as, the, as the fluorescent protein is exposed to the different pH environments of um, the different uh, membrane compartments. And so I think the key feature is that what these techniques all measure essentially are the membrane dynamics. And so the question that we're really interested in is what, what the dynamics and functions are, not just of the membrane, but of, of the endocytic molecules that are generating forces to deform and, and, and drive these trafficking, trafficking events. And so, uh, and, and these are also, I mean, we've also gained insight by comparing these uh, in, in wild type and mutant synapses. But again, none of them can really monitor the recruitment and activities of the molecules the way um, the molecular dynamic studies in say yeast and cultured cells have done. And so, and, and I think that this is a really big barrier because as we just discussed on the previous slide there, we, we believe there really is quite a large pool of inactive molecules at synaptic membranes. And so that really uh, leads us to, to need a, a, a different strategy to monitor when and where the endocytic machinery is activated so that we have uh, a, a readout that's highly resolved in space and time, but also can be directly related to things like the machinery and to the release events themselves. And so our strategy for, for this work has been to focus on really a, a primary output of the endocytic machinery, this force generating F act and assembly. And so the rationale for that, and this, this, this movie here is uh, a movie that you'll see very many of these movies throughout the talk probably, um, this is a visualization of F actin dynamics at a fly neuromuscular junction. Uh, so this is basically the synaptic terminal. Uh, there might be upwards of 10 release sites across this surface here. Uh, and each of these uh, dark areas here is an accumulation of an F actin binding peptide that's labeled with GFP. So we can visualize as the uh, actin assembles at the membrane. And so the, the rationale for using this as a readout is that we know that actin dynamics are required for synaptic endocytosis and recycling in a number of synapses, including this one. It's a direct readout of the activation of this machinery. Um, and I think one of the questions that we have uh, is, is whether we can be sure that, um, that these actin events uh, are in fact endocytosis. And this is a question that we continue to wrestle with and we, we do have lines of evidence for it, but maybe I can save that as a, point of discussion uh, because, and, and this is important because actin has many roles of the synapse besides simply driving uh, endocytosis and recycling. And so what are some of the open questions about this synaptic endocytosis process that we can answer by, by really analyzing these actin dynamics and their regulatory uh, proteins? So again, so this is basically a schematic of the um, of release and reuptake, and, and this is a sort of a diagram of the synapse. And so what we'd like to know is where these endocytic events occur relative to sites of synaptic vesicle release. And this is really uh, an interesting question because we know that different release sites, so different active zones, can have up to 50-fold um, difference in their release uh, probability. So you can have some sites that are very, very unlikely to release vesicles, e even some that are completely silent at different developmental stages, and then some that are much more likely to release. And so, um, so what's the relationship between 
sort of the molecular dynamics of the machinery and the output, both in terms of actin synthesis and endocytosis, and, and, and that, that's really a way to analyze those spatial dynamics. Now we can ask when uh, do endocytosis events occur relative to sites of specific sites of synaptic vesicle release. And, and I think this is really uh, in interesting to consider knowing that different stimulation paradigms and, and different regimes of synaptic activity can result in very different rates and modes of membrane uptake. And then what are the molecular mechanisms that actually trigger an endocytosis event uh, with some spatial and temporal uh, relationship to a release event? And then finally, um, the, the question that we're really going to focus on for the most of the rest of this is, is how is this machinery not active uh, despite being basically at the membrane all over the synapse? And so, so that, that's really what we're going to uh, talk about. Back to Avi. Okay, so just kind of an overview. That was sort of the um, big questions in the field and sort of how we've honed in. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more uh, about the specific experimental techniques, um, but how we've honed in on a, a tool that we can use to answer some of these interesting cell biological questions. And so um, the, uh, for the next sort of five to 10 minutes, we're going to talk about um, some biochemical experiments that we've done um, that reveal cool features by which protein-protein interactions uh, between these endocytic accessory proteins that I mentioned uh, constrain actin assembly to sites of membrane remodeling. Uh, and so the spoiler on that is that uh, autoregulation within these endocytic accessory proteins restricts actin assembly to the membrane. Then we're going to spend at least 20 minutes um, talking about our search for the in vivo function of this cool mechanism. So um, the story here is that we've been working on the biochemical activities of these endocytic accessory proteins for many, many years and found all kinds of really neat properties, but really struggled to get the right uh, kinds of assays to uh, understand the functions of these mechanisms in vivo. And we have finally, uh, really satisfyingly, I think, gotten to some, some, some really cool approaches and answers. So that's uh, something about our science story that I'm very excited about. And so the spoiler there is that uh, uh, the same mechanism can both suppress endocytosis where it's not needed and perhaps activate it where it is. Uh, and then if there's time, we're going to talk a little bit about the specific nature of the um, broad distribution of these endocytic accessory proteins across the synapse, because it turns out to that they are not just a fuzz surrounding active zones, but there's actually quite a lot of structure to how they're organized. Uh, and we've been developing um, together with Thomas Fay, who I think is here in the audience today, uh, who's a, a new math professor at Brandeis, some really neat techniques to, uh, to ask how these proteins are organized. Okay, so uh, just to uh, uh, hone in on, on the proteins that we've chosen to study. So I told you there are, um, you know, 50 plus endocytic accessory proteins. This protein-protein interaction network shows you a small subset of them. I think this is back from 2011. So you can see there's many, many proteins. Uh, we don't, we know a little bit about what some of them do, but we focused particularly on these three that are illustrated over here. And so, uh, the reason that we focus on them is because they have really neat activities that we've discovered. Um, and so uh, nervous rec is a protein that contains a membrane binding and deforming F-bar domain. Uh, and then two SA3 domains uh, that interact with these partners, WASP, which promotes actin assembly um, through the ARP23 complex. Okay, and so we know um, from our work and then also from um, uh, work in, um, on the mammalian versions of these proteins that this is an important regulator of actin assembly and endocytosis. So that um, is one of the reasons that we focused on this particular module. And so in terms of what we've learned about how these proteins work, I'm just gonna, uh, we're just gonna uh, not show you any of the data. A lot of it is published uh, in the papers that you can see below and in uh, a, a preprint that describes uh, most of the work that we're gonna talk about today, but not all of it. So basically what we know is that nervous rec is auto inhibited. So in addition to these SH3 domains binding to uh, WASP and this regulator uh, DAP160, which in mammals is called intersectin, we've also found that those SH3 domains 
bind directly to the FBAR domain. And that autoregulatory interaction inhibits both membrane binding and interaction with SH3 binding partners. So that auto-inhibited conformation is sort of a closed state. And what we found, kind of surprisingly, uh, and contrary to expectations, is that when nervous rec binds to the membrane through its FBAR domain, it doesn't just open up and release its SH3 domains to float around in solution using a, a number of different approaches. We showed that those SH3 domains are actually still uh, retained in sort of a clamped form in the membrane and aren't available to interact with uh, partners such as WASP. Uh, sorry, to activate. So, so uh, even when WASP is present, uh, nervous rec stays in this sort of clamp conformation and you don't get productive actin assembly on the membrane. And so what it takes is addition of this additional binding partner, intersectin or DAP160, to really fully activate the complex and get actin assembly. And so you get this kind of sort of coincidence detector where both DAP160 and WASP and nervous rec and the membrane all have to be there. And the result of this is that you never get in vitro spurious actin assembly in solution. You only get actin assembly uh, in the presence of all these factors coupled to membranes. Okay, is this still me? This is still you, yes. Okay, all right. Okay, so, uh, so then we have this cool mechanism where we have this sort of uh, this clamp that can be released uh, and we really wanted to explore what does this mean at a synapse. And um, uh, so I'm just gonna take you a little bit more through the model system so you can visualize what we're looking at. Uh, and so we're working in Drosophila for a lot of reasons that's fantastically genetically amenable. All of the machinery is conserved compared to um, other kinds of neurons that people study, um, but it's sort of a pared down version. So there's only kind of one copy of each, um, each one of these uh, endocytic accessory proteins in general. And we're studying this problem uh, in, the, in the synapse that Bre Steve briefly introduced, but I'm gonna describe in a little bit more detail. So it's the larval neuromuscular junction. And so the larvae is this cute guy you see at the bottom of the life cycle here. Um, it's about you know, two or three millimeters long and we can dissect it open into a fillet that exposes the neuromusculature. So you can see all the muscles of the larvae and the motor neurons have their cell bodies up in the brain of the larvae and they send down a long axon to innervate the muscle to drive contraction. And there at the axon terminal, you can see the neuromuscular junction, which sort of looks like these beads on a string. This whole structure is, um, you know, 100 microns long, something like that. Each one of these boutons is two to five microns across. And so that's really amenable for all kinds of live and fixed light microscopy. Um, and so the movies that we're going to show you today were acquired in this fillet preparation. Um, uh, on um, uh, our spinning disc confocal, which is called Jabberwocky that you can see here. Um, and uh, this is great because we can take a neuron in its normal developmental context from an animal that was crawling around in a vial two minutes ago, uh, and we can really visualize these synaptic endocytosis events um, uh, uh, discreetly, and you can see them over here, and then we can couple that with measures of neuronal function and, and physiology. And eventually when we get to it, we can try these different stimulation paradigms. But again, all the experiments that I'm gonna we're gonna talk about today are in synapses at rest. And so, you know, we had these great tools uh, and we had this great mechanism in vitro and we really wanted to know how does it apply in vivo. And we took a lot of movies on this microscope. This took a long time for us to get to the point where we could collect these movies. And then we spent uh, probably, I don't know, a year, two years, looking at these movies, trying to figure out how to extract quantitative information about them so we could really understand what was going on. So you guys who are watching um, this talk can look at these movies for a very small fraction of the amount of time <laughs> that we did and try to guess what was going on and imagine what kinds of quantitative approaches you could use, um, but we will save you the year of trying to figure out how to do it and tell you how we did it. <laughs> and so basically that there's, a, there's several approaches that uh, have been published, some of which were published at the time that we were struggling with this and, and some of which have been published later. <clears throat> but but um, they're all quantitative approaches to analyzing endocytic dynamics. 
so this CME analysis from the Dan Uzer lab um, was designed to work with turf microscopy of adherent cells and it has some advantages such as working with very low signal to noise and they also added on a computational framework that helps to classify different endocytic events based on um, the molecular dynamics. And then two, two, different uh, two different tools that were developed for yeast uh, from the Drubin lab and from Julian Barrow uh, when he was in Tom Pollard's lab um, that, uh, that, it, that, that measure molecular and, and patch dynamics um, of, of yeast endocytic events. And, and so, basically, so this one was already uh, released when we were working with this and Julian actually um, was able to help us personally to, to get it working in our system uh, and, and really interface well already with uh, our, our different imaging approaches. So this is what we're gonna focus on, but we're also, um, we, we've been playing around with some of the other approaches as well to see if we can get uh, more information. Um, but the strategy here is that this really relies on spot detection and then particle tracking to identify and follow um, act and assembly events over time. And then uh, using those um, identifications basically can extract uh, intensity fluctuations over time, and then from all that extract information like the frequency of assembly events, uh, how long they last, what the molecular dynamics are. And again, this all comes from, from um, this patch tracker tool. And uh, one of the things that we noticed right away was that the patch lifetimes on average are very similar to uh, what Julian observed uh, in yeast, although we see a much wider spread uh, of, of lifetimes um, may be consistent with different functional properties or maybe just reflecting this the differences in how the machinery works. And so uh, once we got this tool up and working, we wanted to know what happens to these different these patches uh, if we mutate different regulators. And so um, I'm just going to show you data for, uh, for two of these, so WASP and um, Nervous Rec. Um, but you can imagine for WASP, so again, this is really the proximal activator of ARP23 to drive uh, actin assembly. And so uh, for, for this, I think we, we certainly expect the relatively simple phenotype of even, either seeing fewer or weaker patches. And uh, not to leave you in suspense too long, that is in fact what we see. So when we compare a control synapse to a, a WASP um, hypermorph mutant, um, we see that uh, the mutant has a 30% decrease in actin patches. And so we can, we can classify this a little bit more in detail by looking at patches of different lifetimes. So here the x-axis is simply describing um, different bins of patches that have different lifetimes. So zero to 20 seconds, 20 to 40 seconds, and so on. And then the y-axis is simply the, uh, the spatial frequency. So how many events are happening in, per a unit space um, and what you can see is that the control compared to the, the wasp mutant here has less across the entire spectrum of lifetimes. Um, and when we, again, when we just quantify that and present it in, in a more simple to interpret bar graph form, we can see again that there's a significant decrease um, across all the patches. And, and so again, so that really reflects this direct role and sort of why they're not all gone could reflect that the, the idea that there's many other uh, actinucleators that, that could be operating and other pathways, and also the fact that this is a, a hypomorph. And so for nervous rec, though, um, I, I think that the, the expectation of what the phenotype might be is a little bit more complicated for two reasons. So one is because um, is nervous rec behaving in vivo more as an activator, you know, reflecting its ability uh, to promote actin assembly when it's fully complex with DAP160 and WASP at the membrane, or is there reflecting perhaps some role of the nervous rec as a clamp uh, where um, we, we don't really see this activation of WASP when it's bound on the membrane in the absence of DAP160. And so you can imagine different phenotypes, uh, each of which are potentially consistent with, with these uh, biochemical um, mechanisms. So if it's an activator, we might expect a a, a phenotype that mirrors WASP with, with uh, fewer, briefer, or weaker patches. Whereas if it's really restricting actin assembly, uh, we might expect to see more patches uh, and, and, and perhaps less functional patches. And so the second reason why this, this interpretation is, is fairly complicated is because there's many different proteins that can activate WASP in a wide variety of cellular contexts, some of which 
uh, aren't relevant maybe to our synapse, but many of which in entirely are. And so, um, so anyway, this really frames sort of the, the context for, for um, what's actually happening in this mutant. So again, if you compare a control synapse with a nervous wreck null synapse uh, for the actin dynamics, Again, so this is the same plot where we're looking at different uh, lifetime bins over time and then asking how many of each of these happen. What you can see is that for these uh, briefer patches, there's an increase in the, the number of patches that are assembling in the nervous rec mutant. So suggesting really that maybe one of the primary uh, in vivo functions of nervous rec is actually clamping actin assembly. And this is a, a significant difference um, so if we just ask how, how many of the patches are happening that are less than 32 seconds, you see there's a significant uh, increase. And so this is a, a fairly modest effect, but again, that, that it's happening in a fairly complex in vivo environment. But we feel extremely confident in this result because we see the exact same phenotype, both for the DAP160 mutant and when we look at a mutant of DAP160 that is unable to bind to nervous rec. So we just delete the SH3 domains that interact with nervous rec. And so this is, I'm going to hand back to Avi now. Just okay. to summarize that. Yeah, so just to, to summarize, um, you know, this is one really interesting take home message is there's a reason that there's 50 plus different endocytic accessory proteins. They do different things. Um, and we can start to tease that out um, using this kind of quantitative analysis and with an understanding of the biochemical properties of the proteins. And so we found that um, the wasp mutant has a defective initiation of patches, as you would expect, since it's uh, our branched ARP23 mediated actin assembly is thought to be the major force generating uh, um, apparatus for endocytosis. Uh, and the DAP160 and nervous rec mutants, uh, their main phenotype is this loss of clamping, where you get these kind of um, spurious uh, actin dynamics, which I think we didn't include the FM data, did we, Steve? We didn't, but yeah, so we know that they're unproductive. <laughs> they have defects in, in, in membrane uptake measured by uh, FM dye uptake, yeah. Right. Okay. All right, so is this you or me? This is you. All right, okay, so here's what I, this is, I feel bad because this is Steve's analogy, but I'll share it anyway, because I think it's a great analogy. And so, you know, why do you have this mechanism at Synapse? Why would you, ha why would you have this very broad distribution of endocytic machinery? And sort of one hypothesis relates to the idea of filling a pothole. And so you could imagine that the workers uh, in this image over here might be in California, where there aren't a lot of potholes because they don't, there aren't terrible winters. Uh, and you can sort of bring in a few workers on demand and maybe the shoveler and the tamper would work sequentially. Um, uh, there's a stereotype sequence of recruitment to do the job and then they leave when the job is finished. And so that's fine, unless you're in Massachusetts where your road might look something like this. So there's really a lot of potholes to fill. And so you might want to pre-deploy the workers um, to be available to work where needed. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, you know, they could be holding each other's hands and keeping them from, keeping each other from uh, uh, getting to the, uh, a spot that's not ready to be worked on yet, but some interaction or communication between them is gonna ensure that, that the events occur in the right order. And so some benefits of this, many, many workers all deployed um, to uh, many, many sites of endocytosis could be that you have a lower latency in getting the machinery there so that you can get very rapid endocytosis uh, for example, in response to stimulus, you might be able to take up more membrane at once with more players. Um, uh, or there may be emergent functions of these molecules when they're present at high concentrations that wouldn't apply if they were transiently or sequentially recruited. And so that's the, that's the analogy. Um, so actually, maybe this is, uh, I know there, there are a few questions in the chat. Um, Robert Hernan, should we pause now to, chat or keep motoring on? Uh, uh, sorry, Avi. I actually don't even have permission to unmute myself. So I have oh. to wait for somebody to unmute me before I can <laughs> even say anything. All right. uh, I, my vote is that we, uh, that we make, you go until the end and I'll, or not, I'll try and parse the questions. Okay. Um, yeah. 
Sorry, I sorry about the muting sniffle. I don't think there's any super pressing questions that are gonna stand in the way. But thank you for asking. And again, sorry for just like this blatant silence. I just I was sitting here just uh, waving my hands. I can't I can't undo any of it. Anyway, oh, keep going. All right, you can you can text me if you want to Okay. I, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, so what we want to do now is we, we've discovered this, these cool mechanisms using um, some great tools uh, that you know, we developed for imaging uh, and that um, others have developed for analysis of similar structures. But we wanted to sort of pause here and talk about some assumptions that we've made uh, in doing this quantitative analysis that maybe we should do a second think about. OK, so we know that actin plays many roles at synapses, uh, including in mobilizing vesicle pools, in setting up the overall morphology of the synapse, maybe in different forms of local transport. And so to assume that all of these structures that we're seeing uh, are endocytic is maybe a bit of too much of an assumption. Um, and so in thinking about this, uh, 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 you know, something we've been considering for some time and talking about doing, but we were sort of busy in the lab. And then, as you can see here from these beautiful images, the coronavirus uh, pandemic began and we all went home and could not do any more experiments. And so we were forced to really um, uh, think about, you know, what, what, what can we do with our time at home? Uh, to, to really challenge these assumptions. And so what we're gonna talk about now is a completely orthogonal approach that Steve came up with um, to challenge uh, some of the assumptions that we were making. So the endocytic tools that we were using to measure those patch dy dynamics explicitly exclude patches that are too close together, patches that don't look very patchy or don't, you know, and, and they ignore anything that isn't a spot. They ignore very brief and very long events. And this is really important relative to whatever imaging frequency and duration that we've chosen, which was either one or um, 0.25 Hertz and somewhere around four minute movies. Um, and so the question is, can we design an approach that doesn't make these assumptions and see if we can see differences between our control and mutant samples? Sure. And so what we uh, have come up with so far, and this is still sort of work in progress. And so obviously this is, this is an area in particular where we would love any sort of feedback. Um, but basically we have a movie, which isn't playing, but you've seen them many times now. Um, and so uh, our strategy is to just get out numbers in an unbiased way. And so what I do is take the entire stack of, of um, images and make a sum projection. So basically adding up each individual frame all together to get a composite view of the uh, area to be analyzed. And then threshold this by, um, by intensity and get a mask. And then for each individual slice measure uh, uh, using the same uh, region of interest that generated from this mask. And then in terms of analyzing the dynamics, the strategy is to take those intensity values for each pixel for each frame and then ask basically how much, how well does uh, frame two look like frame one or frame three look like frame one and so on and so forth. And so basically a measure of how um, persistent the image is over time. So you can imagine in a extremely idealized uh, way that if you had basically the limiting case where it was the exact same image over time, then you would see absolutely no decay in the measure, which is in this case a Pearson's correlation coefficient. Whereas if you had some sort of linear change uh, in the um, image over time, you might see this uh, decay where, where so the, the amount of decay um, and the rate of decay really corresponds to how much the image is changing from frame to frame. And so if we take this approach and then apply it to the same movies that we've been analyzing by Patch Tracker, we, we do in fact see a difference. So, so here in green, this is the, um, the, the autocorrelation, the autocorrelation meaning the, the, the comparison over time of each frame to frame one. And what you can see is that it does indeed decay uh, over time. So, which is entirely consistent with the idea that there's dynamics in, in both movies. But what we see for our mutant condition, in this case, looking at this DAP160 domain mutant that doesn't interact with nervous rec, you see this steeper initial decline 
and then uh, a higher plateau uh, where it, it eventually these lines cross over each other. And so, um, so these both look like exponential decays. And so the, the first difference is that um, um, a, a one phase exponential decay uh, fits um, the, the full length, whereas a two phase better fits the uh, mutant. And, and we see very different um, rate constants in their decay. So the, uh, there's basically there's a strong fast component for the uh, mutant, uh, whereas uh, really just a, a much longer uh, slow constant or a longer time constant for the full length. So suggesting that there is some difference here in between these and that, that there's some initial decay that some dynamics that are faster in our mutant relative to our wild type. And so um, what do these differences actually mean? What's the relationship between, you know, this sort of general decay, the general dynamics and what's actually happening uh, in our images. And so there's a number of features that we could look at here, sort of the initial and uh, long decay, um, whether there's any sorts of oscillations in the decay. So oscillation is something that's very common for uh, autocorrelation traces um, or uh, differences in, in, in the degree to which these traces, uh, the correlation decays over time. And so for patch tracker, we're really directly measuring the features of the actin dynamics. And so what we want to what we were wrestling with was how to extract similar information from these autocorrelation plots, and then how this information can actually help us answer some open biological questions. So just before I dive into some more granular uh, and perhaps opaque uh, in information, I just want to kind of reiterate sort of what these open questions are and why we're, we're going after these numbers. And so again, this is where these endocytic events are happening in space across the synapse when they're occurring in, in response to stimuli, and then what the different properties of these f and dynamics are. So information like their frequency and their amplitude um, can help us identify perhaps different uh, types of actin structures that might have different functions or different functional capacities. And so these we think are, are all open and important questions for, um, for the synapse. And so basically, uh, this is a fairly unsophisticated approach. I really just wanted to have some idea of how these different parameters would look if, if we built them, baked them into this autocorrelation analysis. And so basically I just started with an image and then um, had some rule, and, and this is basically our toy synapse. And every pixel um, can either be in, in this case off, which is black or on, which is white. And that's really how big an assembly event is. Uh, and then in terms of how often an assembly event gets triggered, uh, we can assign each pixel that is off some probability of turning on. And so that's, that's one of the rules that's baked in. We can set how long an assembly event lasts, which is how, how long a pixel stays on once it's on. And that can either be uh, an entirely determined or a probabilistic lifetime. And then where actin is assembling, which is basically the fraction of space within our whole um, fake synapse here that's able to turn on. And you can imagine that that's very much relates to this idea of, say, an active zone versus a periactive zone. So these different areas that might, in biology, might be more or less competent to turn on. And so just when you, so this is just an example. So here we have 10% of the space is available to turn on. On is equal to 255. And then uh, all the off pixels turn on with a 10% chance and then uh, last for four frames. And so I just wanted to sort of vary these parameters and then say, okay, what happens to our autocorrelation analysis using this? And this is just to get an idea of what our different signals look like. And so I just want to sort of reiterate that this is the exact same analysis um, as what I did, what I just showed for the, for the real uh, data. And so what you can see, so first, so, so the, in terms of the biological question, it's where does assembly happen? And that's simply by varying the amount of space um, that's competent to activate. And what you can see is that as the fraction of pixels uh, gets larger up to a hundred, um, the correlation eventually decays progressively more and more and more. And that makes sense when you consider that there's gonna be some um, fraction of pixels that, that simply can't change in, 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 in this case. Um, and again, so, so with, reg with regard to the decay, the oscillation and the plateau, we're really seeing this difference with um, sort of the percentage of space uh, 
is really affecting the plateau uh, in the steady state correlation. Uh, if we vary instead, so this is the same types of traces, but now we're comparing this uh, instance where the lifetime lasts for only one pixel versus where the lifetime lasts for four pixels, uh, what you can see is two changes. So the first is that the plateau increases, and this makes sense given that the, the sort of degree of, of change is, is happening at a, a longer rate. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can also see that there's a really obvious oscillation that's occurring in a way that corresponds to uh, the lifetime. And so the idea is that that, that that information could at least in principle be extracted if it were um, and again, this is a very idealized version just to help aid in the visualization of it. And so again, just to reiterate the sort of the key take homes here is that the lifetime really both increases uh, the uh, height of the plateau, so the sort of persistence, and then the, uh, the wavelength of the oscillation uh, during the decay. And then uh, the final parameter that, uh, to, to look at is how often is assembly occurring? And, and so this is cl clearly relevant to questions like how often is endocytosis happening in response to a stimulus or, or what happens when we vary the stimuli. And so in this case, um, lifetime of one or lifetime of four, uh, we're going from uh, basically every pixel has a one in a hundred chance to a one in 10 chance to a one in two chance to turn on. You can see that that is um, uh, also driving up the steady state autocorrelation. So it really increasing the plateau. And so then, and so then how does this sort of just playing with uh, idealized numbers, how does this actually help us understand the real data? So the real data says that uh, the nervous right mutant has more patches and that more of the patches are uh, briefer. And so what's the relationship between that and this? And so to do that, uh, I really wanted to be able to manipulate both of those at the same time. So this is, again, just to see what we get when we use sort of real data like inputs as the parameters. And so this is for uh, an image that is 10% dynamic. And if we look at a 10% chance of turning on, um, what we can do is we can change sort of the, we can, we can compose two different lifetimes and then change the ratios between them. So if we have all of the patches that turn on have a lifetime of eight. We see this characteristic uh, trace. If 25% of those now uh, that were eight now become two, we see that the, the, the rate um, sort of de decreases and there's a lower plateau. Now, if there's 25% that are eight and 75% that have a lifetime of two, we see again, much steeper decay and a lower plateau. And then finally, 100% to the steepest decay in, in, uh, in the lowest plateau. And so, so that suggesting that really the balance of different lifetimes can, can you know, affect the data in a predictable way. And so then just to some, choose some values that sure are, are good stereotypes for what we see for the uh, mutant in control. So I, I'm just choosing a scenario where um, most of the, uh, patches are, or most of the dynamics are of a long lifetime in the control. And then for the mutant, it, more of them are brief and there's also a higher rate of them. And so basically this is to model based on our um, patch tracker data, two conditions where there's lower overall dynamics and fewer short events in the control and then greater overall dynamics and shorter events in the mutant. And what you can see is that this you know, it at least starts to approximate what we see for the output. So suggesting that there is, that we can, um, using some uh, parameters that we sort of derive from the patch tracker, get an autocorrelation plot that's consistent with our real data. And so obviously that's just a fraction of the parameter space um, and it doesn't address everything. And so, so I think like sort of next steps are really to refine that in, in a way that allows us to build a, a more quantitative model of, of how all those uh, inputs are interacting and then to be able to extract from this uh, these same types of patch tracker uh, values. And then I think you know the next level of analysis is to use these insights to go back to our movies and start to ask different questions. So for instance, things like, are there hot spots of active assembly where does the assembly of one spot sort of predict a future assembly event uh, and, and to measure uh, how much of the space is, is dynamic. And so, so because we can see that these are relevant measures based on this sort of toy analysis, uh, 
uh, we can sort of redesign some of our imaging approaches to better uh, pull out these. And I think that these are really interesting considering the, uh, the biology of the periactive zone relative to the active zone and, and help us get at some of those questions that we outlined. And so just to summarize that part, uh, in back to Avi. So um, uh, hopefully we've been able to uh, communicate to you how we've um, taken biochemical information, so collected and taken biochemical information about how the molecular machinery of endocytosis um, can work in vitro, uh, and then gone to the synapse, uh, collected some pretty complex imaging data, and then used different approaches to uh, understand what, uh, in, in mutant synapses, to understand what the role of these specific uh, components of the machinery do. Um, and so, uh, you know, our challenge has been to understand how and why these proteins exist at such high concentration in this complex and persistent organization at the synaptic membrane, you know, why all these different proteins are even there. And this is important because many of these proteins are, are mutated in human disease. They're, uh, you know, sort of the features of how a synapse becomes a highly specialized uh, cell and region of the cell. Um, uh, and so by using these kinds of approaches, by looking specifically at the output of this machinery uh, at the actin dynamics, we've been able to get um, spatial and temporal information to understand how um, these key force producers deform membranes to look where, when, and how uh, the endocytic machinery is active uh, and understand how it works. And, you know, the, the message is that uh, the mutant phenotypes could give surprising results. We didn't know whether to predict whether this machinery would primarily function to drive actin assembly. I think that was sort of the simplest hypothesis, but it turns out that one of its main functions is to constrain actin assembly to the sites where and when it's needed. And so when we mutate this machinery, we get these changes in dynamics of the actin. So more patches that are, um, shorter in lifetimes and then our functional assays say that they're not uh, working to internalize membrane. And so there's a lot of big open questions that, that remain and now we have these great powerful approaches. We can start asking what happens when we fire this synapse at different rate and so we, we have electrophysiological access to the synapse. Um, we can also stimulate the neurons using optogenetics. There's all kinds of approaches since we're in vivo in an animal. Um, we can ask questions like what triggers the switch, both spatially and temporally, from the clamp to the activated machinery? How do these mechanisms respond to different levels of synaptic activity? And by using kind of an object-based approach like the patch tracker and complementing it with a more um, unbiased approach like the correlation analysis, but looking at that pixel-by-pixel pixel approach in the context of how close is that pixel to an active zone? You know, what happens uh, in, in a synapse that's that's being activated. Uh, we can you know, really start to uh, pick apart uh, questions that we've been asking for decades about how this machinery works. So it's a pretty exciting time for us. And I think- I think we hit we our probably, one hour. I think we hit our one hour. Right. That's a good stopping point. Beautiful, thank you so much. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. okay, great. Yeah, so thanks again, wonderful talk. And there are a bunch of questions. I'm gonna to try to curate them and, and put them together. So some of them share share some some share a topic or share a thread. So I guess you know, related to the to the very last thing that, that Steve was showing us in terms of the autocorrelations, uh, there's a there's a bunch of questions. So maybe we should start there. Um one that also that that I just saw that also struck me is um has to do with the time scales. So the, there seems to be a little bit of a like, I wasn't quite clear of the units of your simulation versus the unit of uh, units of the data and whether they were matched and whether there's something to learn about it or it's just a free parameter that you still need to figure out. So maybe we can start there. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, so for the modeling, it's it's simply frame, I, I mean, really the modeling and the imaging in terms of the, the measure is really just frame by frame. And so I think to the extent that the time scales are different, that's it's really, just reflecting sort of the rates of change of the molecular dynamic of, of like sort of the modeled or measured dynamics. And so those, we, we can change those. 
Um, so yeah, I think the lifetime of one and the lifetime of four, for example, were just basically arbitrarily chosen, not based on the data. Okay. Right. So agree, Steve. Yes, and, 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 and so so it was really just to illustrate more than to you know, <laughs> directly relate. And and I think that one one of the things that I've also so things that I've varied that maybe are relevant to this are things like instead of simply going on and off, you know, having some sort of ramping of intensity values, which, you know, I think all of these sort of more subtle things that um, approximate the real data better, they didn't change sort of those fundamental, they, they just kind of smoothed, smoothed things out. And so I, I chose not to include those other elements here just to sort of make it as black and white as, as, as I could. Can I pick a question to answer, Hernan? Of course, yeah, go for it. Just because we're on that note, um, uh, there's this question of um, when you increase the lifetime to four, do you have the phase of all the oscillations the same, like at time zero? Just just to be clear about how that how that worked. Yeah, so basically, it's a, it's initialized randomly and then run for several lifetimes, and then and then we start the autocorrelation, which is effectively like the real life scenario where the neuron's been alive for days. And behaving and then we just jump in at a time and it doesn't seem to make a difference whether we whether i jump in randomly or whether i jump in you know at some sort of anchored time like two lifetimes or something like that we, we still see this this oscillation which i think just reflects the, the yeah the, the oscillation of the values great and you know one question that is also related to this is how does one connect these acting correlations with with endocytosis I can take that one, maybe. So, so this goes to the, the question is, can we really assume that these actin structures that we're looking at even are endocytosis? And so our arguments for this are, um, some of them are, are a little bit biased. These patch structures, they sure look like endocytosis in other cell types in terms of their dynamics, the on and off. Their dynamics depend on canonical endocytic proteins. Um, and when we alter their dynamics, we actually lose the function of endocytosis in that the synapses don't take up dyes. And so those are several lines of circumstantial evidence. In terms of um, the correlations themselves being endocytosis, we think you know we're correlating the dynamics of the actin to the endocytic function uh, in a way that doesn't um, make those sort of object-based assumptions. But, but whether or not the actin dynamics are, are endocytosis, those are kind of our main lines of evidence for that. Right. Um, let me ask you a question, and I think maybe this is something I missed in the beginning. Okay. Uh, but you, know, you guys had this map of the released locations, right? And I, do, did I understand that those are maintained stably over time? Do you want so to go to the next slide, well Steve? There's some developmental dynamics to those. So basically, as the active zone matures, the, the release probability can change. So this is work from Troy Littleton's lab um, okay. in, in showing that sort of the composition of the active zone uh, correlates with its release probability. And so that's actually a strategy that we're, you know, with Troy's help, we're, we're, we're using to relate the, the actin and endocytic dynamics to the release probability. So asking, you know, for a high PR, active zone, what does the associated periactive zone look like? So if, if you can imagine two different scenarios, one where if the local release probability matters, if, if sort of endocytosis is a local property, then we, we would expect to see some relationship in both the endocytic machinery and the output, the actin assembly, whereas if it's more of a global phenomenon and the whole apparatus is really adapted more broadly, then we, we wouldn't expect to see that correlation. So th these are questions that we're trying to answer right now, actually. But in terms right. of sort of the feasibility of that approach, it definitely depends on the active zone not drifting around the synapse, and it does not. Right. So you can follow a single active zone over days, and it does not move around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, so, so yeah, so another question that is, uh, I have the question, and now I see uh, and, and one that popped out as well. Uh, you know, the, the nice thing about it, uh, correlations is that it allows you to dissect dynamic signatures. But sometimes you miss information about the absolute levels of the signals, right? And so, you know, one question I, 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 that was posted by one of the, of the attendees it has to do with, the, is there a correlation between the number of proteins recruited and the duration of these endocytic events or even their location? But also, uh, you know, what, 
have you guys been, you know, what, what do you learn from the intensity of the signals as, as you're monitoring these events? Sure. So that's something that we've dug into a little less just because it, 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 we haven't seen changes really in the intensity profiles depending in our mutants. And so I would say just because of that, we focus less on that. I, I have done some sort of just general correlations between those things, and I don't see at least an obvious correlation between. So if you look at sort of the, the, the min to max um, uh, or half maximal sort of fluctuation in intensity, uh, you don't see a strong correlation to lifetime, for instance. And I, and, and right. that's, that's I, I, probably surprising, but, but it's also important to know that we're not to note that we're not looking directly at the actin here. We're just looking at a, a binding peptide and we see pretty wide fluctuations in sort of the overall levels of that. And, which, do, which doesn't, inf which I've checked and doesn't impact our dynamics, but it could be relevant for, for that. And I haven't sussed that out, but and, and anyway, a different no, question. a strong relationship at this point. A different question. So one question is the intensity of the actin signal, like how much actin do you assemble, but maybe that's, you know, more or less fixed for a productive endocytic event. And another interesting question is what's the intensity of the endocytic proteins? Um, at a, you know, maybe a high probability endocytic site versus a low probability endocytic site. And so that's something that Steve's really actively working on is using um, super resolution imaging, uh, quantitative imaging to actually map the protein concentrations relative to activity surrounding uh, uh, active zones with different properties. Great. Um, one question from Ricky Garner, who maybe you've met Abby last year. Um, she was in the course helping uh, teach, uh, helping Julie teach. Is uh, she's curious about spatial cor cross correlations in image data? You know, have you tried anything like this, perhaps to measure growth and lateral movement of the patches? Uh, I have not. So I think for the this broad approach, I, I think it's hard to really assign. Uh, any fluctuations to any specific structure. So basically the, the cross correlation simply doesn't care where the pixels are. It's just looking at the pixels. Um, and in terms of, but we, we have um, used patch tracker. Patch tracker can um, identify and, and look at the lateral movement of patches. But, but honestly, that's not something that we've really looked at extensively because most of the structures that we're interested in seem to be pretty static in the, in the XY plane. Okay. Great. Um, you know, Abby and, and Steve, you should also feel free to pick some questions. Uh, one that I, I was uh, curious about is like the very first question that was asked, uh, how do you determine or physically make sense of the molar concentration of the machinery at the synapse, considering that the memory is a, is a 2D surface? And, you know, the thing that this made me wonder is, you know, there's these things are pretty crowded, right? I'm assuming that these membrane proteins are quite on top of each other. So, you know, how much room is there for all these rearrangements? That's the type of thing that also uh, made, me, made me curious about when, when reading the, this question. So what we've done to, to address this is to measure the overall concentration using best quantitative methods we can by spinning disconfocal imaging of GFP knock-ins onto the endogenous proteins and really trying to be very careful about this quantification so we get a mean concentration in the whole bouton. And then we do sim microscopy, structured illumination microscopy to get the spatial pattern. And then we map that average protein concentration onto the intensities from sim. Okay, and so that way we can calculate at least a local concentration in a pretty thin, thin sim slice. Um, uh, and, and from that, we, we get protein concentrations from one to five micromolar uh, in, you know, at the best, that's the best that our imaging resolution can get us to. And they may be more concentrated than that. Um, and so how, how do you think about that? That's pretty dense. And so no one will be surprised to learn that when you mix these proteins together that have polyproline and SH3 domain interactions at those concentrations, in the absence of any depletants, they rapidly phase separate. And so of course, of course that, that's likely to be going on and it's something that um, Steve is very actively thinking about and that we're, we're, we're very actively thinking about how that works. But I mean, that's the kind of obvious hypothesis. Mm -hmm. and, there's, and there's a lot of thinking out there about um, phase separation and endocytic proteins and what kind of work that might do. And yeah. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> um, then maybe more of a, of a molecular question is, 
there, there were some questions related to DAP 160. One question was, were you able to differentiate between the functions of uh, what is nervous wreck? And I, I would love actually to hear how they came up with that with that name, if there's an interesting phenotype there, and DAP, and DAP 160. And there was another question that was, I'm curious about what the, what exactly is triggering binding of DAP 60. Could you could two different triggers be possible, and would there be a reason for the different dynamics in the mutants? So, kind of related questions. I can answer the protein name question, and Steve can answer the science question. How, how's that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so nervous rack was isolated in a screen for temperature sensitive paralytic mutants. And so, at the restrictive temperature of 38 degrees, the nervous rack mutants fall to the bottom of the vial and have seizures. Uh, and so that is where the mutant name comes from. And there's some really interesting biology behind it. Um, uh, but that's the name. All right. So, so for the different functions, so if you look at their null mutants, and this is work by us and, and, and other labs o over a decade, uh, or more than a decade, th there's actually a lot of overlap in their null mutant phenotypes, including uh, changes in synaptic growth as well as endocytosis. So, and we, we did look at that and compared it also to the domain mutant. And so what, what I would say is that for, and for the FM dye uptake, we see very, very similar degrees of phenotype in, in, in both, the, uh, both nulls and in the domain mutant. But if you look at the synaptic growth phenotype, for instance, uh, in the null, each null you see a growth phenotype, but in the domain mutant, you don't. So to my mind, that suggests that with regard to this specific interaction um, that we think is regulating actin dynamics, that it seems to be coupled more to uh, membrane uptake, FM dye uptake, um, than to the, the synaptic growth functions. And, and that's also likely to be related to endocytosis and membrane trafficking of, of the growth factors, but it seems to separate out that by using the domain mutant. And then in terms of the, the other question was, um, what turns step 160 on oh, to yeah. initiate so, this whole thing? Yeah, so that, I mean, it, it, we're not sure. I mean, so there's models that DAP 160 or and other types of endocytic proteins like this could be residing in, say, a synaptic vesicle pool. And so there's like a, a there's this delivery model where basically a release event is sort of bringing the relevant activator to the surface where it can drive endocytosis. Um, that's one possibility. Uh, obviously, there's lots of other signaling happening in terms of um, phosphatases and calcium signaling and things like that. And, and, and so we haven't analyzed that. Um, but, but there is work suggesting that the phosphorylation on DAP160, at least in, for mammalian intersectin, this is from Volker Hawks lab, uh, can, can control its, its, its localization between vesicle and membrane pools. And so, so both of these could be relevant. But, but I, I would say in this specific case, we don't have great data for that. But yeah. Yeah. all right, well, thank you so much. I think we should probably wrap it up. So thanks again, Avi and Steve for a great talk. Uh, we will make this talk available online at the, at the course website. And hopefully, uh, you know, if there, there are a few questions that we didn't get to answer. So Molly, hopefully we'll be able to send these over to you guys. That, also, uh, that might be that might be useful because there are some interesting suggestions there as well. And if anyone has any questions they didn't write into the chat and they want to either talk to us in person about it or email us about it, we, we would be absolutely delighted to get your input and feedback. I see there's some great questions in here about you know, denoising and deep learning. And you know we're just starting to learn how to do all that. And so we'd love to get people's feedback and input and how to turn our autocorrelation analysis into a, an actual equation that we can extract features out of. We're still figuring that out. So. Fantastic. Fantastic. And hopefully you can join us tomorrow at 9 a.m. again. Uh, Amy Gladfelter is going to give a talk about organization of the cytoplasm. And I'm assuming that it's going to be about her work on, on phase separation in the in the cytoplasm, which is super cool. And it, and she also is a great speaker. So I hope I hope to see you all tomorrow. So until then, have a great rest of your day, everybody. Stay safe and see you tomorrow. And again, thanks, Abby and Steve. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Bye. That was good. All right, take care.